here on VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Faith Perlow, Gregory Stockel, and Dan Friedel. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Faith Perlow. Even though Labrador Retrievers are still the United States' number one dog for over three decades, the active and intelligent poodle has made a strong return to the top ten since 1997. The American Kennel Club's rankings of popular dog breeds just came out with some surprising results. While dog breeding is still a debatable topic, purebreds and mixes are still increasing in popularity. The American Kennel Club is a nonprofit organization recognized for its knowledge of dog breeds, training, and health. The AKC held its yearly rankings on the most popular breeds from last year's list of almost 800,000 purebred puppies and dogs. Labrador Retrievers are still America's number one choice after 31 years. But there were some surprising results. Poodles have not been in the top 10 for 25 years. Now they have moved to fifth place. In all, there were 197 breeds featured. The top 10 includes Dachshunds, German short-haired pointers, Rottweilers, Beagles, Bulldogs, Poodles, German Shepherds, Golden Retrievers, French Bulldogs, and Labrador Retrievers, also called Labs. Poodles of all sizes ruled as most popular dog for 22 years, between 1960 and 1982, before decreasing in popularity. Now they have regained a top spot for the first time in almost 25 years. Poodles are intelligent dogs that were used throughout history to find fresh water. They are very active and complex. Plus, they are good companions for people with allergies. Poodles can provide support for people in hospitals and work as guide dogs for people who cannot see. They can hunt and even compete in obedience or other dog sports. Doodles are a popular mix of poodle and another dog breed. Examples of doodles include Golden Doodles, a mixture of Golden Retriever and Poodle, Labradoodles, a blend of Labrador Retrievers and Poodles, and even Multipoos, a combination of Maltese and Poodle. The AKC governs many dog shows in the United States. It has not yet agreed that the Doodle is a breed. Brandy Hunter is a spokesperson for the AKC. She says that doodle lovers are trying to find a way to have the animal recognized as a breed. The main requirement for recognition is creating a list of traits for the breed that become required. Although the list of popular dogs does not change much from one year to the next, over time, big changes can happen. Since 2000, eight breeds have slowly moved into the top 25 such as the Great Dane and the Pembroke Welsh Corgi. Some dog breeds have quickly entered the top 25, like French Bulldogs and the Cane Corso. The Cane Corso moved from 51st to 21st within 11 years. I'm Faith Perlow.
Many gardeners do not begin to grow their plants from seeds. Instead, they buy young plants, also called seedling or starts. These are plants that are grown in a nursery, a place where plants are grown and sold. Many gardeners buy seedlings in containers for their gardens. Most nursery seedlings are either plants that last for one growing season or are vegetables. They come in plastic containers holding four to six plants. Many people also buy starts in individual containers. But it is important to pay attention when buying spring starts. A gardener usually cannot go back and begin again in the middle of spring or summer. And a good gardener wants to have plants that perform for the season. Here is some helpful information to help get good plants. The first step is finding a good nursery. A good gardener will ask themselves if it looks like the nursery grows its own plants or buys them from larger growers. Nurseries that grow their own spring starts usually take good care of them. The larger growers, or wholesalers, might not be able to do so. Make sure the plants have been watered correctly. If not, the seedlings will have a hard time developing. If there are lots of half-dead or dried-out plants, it is often a sign to buy elsewhere. Next, before buying a grouping of seedlings, feel the soil. In addition to being wet but not flooded, it should not be dense. That is a sign of it having been dried out. In fact, the soil should smell fresh. Look at the holes at the bottom of the container to see the roots. If the roots are too dense, that is a sign not to buy the plant. Look to see if there has been damage from the wind or sun. Damaged plants will take time to repair. Also look for signs of fungal or bacterial infection. Plants should be free from insects and not have the smell of chemicals. When buying spring plants in cell containers, all the plants in the group should be healthy. If one out of four plants in a grouping is not healthy, the others might not be far behind. A gardener should also know what plants they are buying. Look for the name of the kind of plant, the color, and the height. That information can help gardeners buy the same plants in the future if they perform well. I'm Gregory Stockel. Most children who get COVID-19 show few to no usual signs of sickness. Eight-year-old Brooklyn Childs of Washington, D.C. is one such child. The young girl has tested positive for the virus three times. She is fully vaccinated against the coronavirus she has never shown serious signs of the disease. Today, doctors are trying to understand why she keeps getting infected. 
One time when she caught the virus, her father also got sick. He later died. Her mother, Danielle, is worried that Brooklyn could also get very sick the next time she catches the virus. Child said she wonders if her daughter is going to die too. Is this the moment where I lose everyone, she asked. The COVID-19 pandemic started in late 2019. It is linked to more than 6 million deaths around the world. But its effects on children are not well known. Over 12 million children in the U.S. are estimated to have tested positive for the virus. However, the virus does not seem to be as dangerous for children as it is for older adults. Some people call what happens to children bizarre. Some children suffer from what is known as long COVID. Others get reinfected like Brooklyn. Some even seem to get sick and then recover, only to have severe organ inflammation later on. At Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C., Brooklyn and other children are subjects of a study. Doctors at the hospital are getting money from the National Institutes of Health to study the long-term effects of COVID-19 on children. The hospital has about 200 children up to age 21 in the study, which will go on for three years. They undergo many tests on their first visit to the hospital. Doctors take blood, listen to their heart, and check their lungs. Roberta DiBiase is the doctor leading the study. She said the researchers are trying to understand the problems children suffer after getting COVID and how common they are. Another girl in the study is Alyssa Carpenter. She is three years old. She had COVID-19 two times and also has unusual symptoms, such as high fevers and foot pain. Sometimes she lies down and points to her chest and says she has pain there, too. Alyssa's parents, Tara and Tyson Carpenter, have two other daughters. They said the pandemic caused a lot of problems in their lives. But they are most worried about Alyssa, whom they do not know how to help. Tara Carpenter called the situation super frustrating. She said she has been looking for answers to her daughter's problems but no one is able to provide them. Some days, the little girl is doing just fine. Other days, she has a fever or pain. But lately, the family says she is doing a little better. One doctor working on the study is Linda Herbert. She does a psychological test. She talks to the children about things like the quality of their sleep, the worries they have, how they get along with other children, and whether they have trouble remembering things. She said there are many symptoms, adding that many children are worried about getting sick again. Herbert said, Psychological symptoms are just as common as physical symptoms like pain. And it is not just the children who have a lot of worries. The parents, brothers, and sisters of the children have stress and anxiety, too. Brooklyn's mother, Danielle, is working hard to keep her emotions from affecting her daughter she is working to support her family now that her husband died. She also is dealing with her sadness and trying not to show her feelings to her daughter. She wanted to put Brooklyn in the study so more people would learn about the need for vaccines 
especially among black people. Her husband, Rodney, was not vaccinated. He suffered from pre-existing conditions and died at the age of 42. Childs said one of the last things her husband said before he died was, Forgive me. She said, It is true that many children are not getting sick if they catch the virus. However, they are losing, she said. They're losing parents, social lives, years, Childs said. Yes, kids are resilient, but they can't go on like this. No one is this resilient. I'm Dan Friedel. Welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. I'm Steve Ember. The House of Representatives ended the day's business early on the rainy afternoon of April 12, 1945. The House Democratic leader, Speaker Sam Rayburn, invited a friend to come by his office for a drink. Be there around five, Rayburn said. Harry Truman is coming over. Harry Truman was the vice president at the time. The events are described in a book about his presidency, Conflict and Crisis, by Robert Donovan. World War II was not over yet, but it was a quiet afternoon in Washington. President Franklin Roosevelt was in the southern state of Georgia. He was resting after his recent trip to Yalta to meet with British Prime Minister Winston Churchill and Soviet leader Joseph Stalin. The president's wife, Eleanor, was at the White House working on a speech supporting the new United Nations. Harry Truman was at the Senate, but he was not interested in the debate that was taking place. He spent most of his time writing to his family back in Missouri. When the debate finished, he went to the office of House Leader Rayburn to join him for a drink. It was an afternoon Truman would never forget. Rayburn and his friend were talking in the office before Truman arrived. The telephone rang. It was a call from the White House asking whether the vice president had arrived yet. No, Rayburn replied. The caller asked him to have Truman telephone the White House as soon as he arrived. Truman entered a minute later. He immediately called the White House. As he talked, his face became white. He put down the phone and raced out the door to his car. Truman arrived at the White House within minutes. An assistant took him up to the president's private living area. Eleanor Roosevelt was waiting for him there. Harry, she said, the president is dead. Truman was shocked. He asked Mrs. Roosevelt if there was anything he could do to help her. But her reply made clear to him that his own life had suddenly changed. Is there anything we can do for you? Mrs. Roosevelt asked the new president. You are the one in trouble now. Within hours, the world learned the news that Franklin Roosevelt, the longest serving president in American history, was dead. He died of a cerebral hemorrhage, bleeding in the brain. Americans were shocked and scared. It was 1945, and the United States was still at war. Roosevelt had led the nation since early 1933. He was the only president many young Americans had ever known. Who would lead them now? All eyes turned to Harry Truman. Our departed leader never looked backward. He looked forward and moved forward. That is what he would want us to do. That is what America will do. 
Harry Truman in his first speech to Congress as president. With great humility, I call upon all Americans to help me keep our nation united in defense of those ideals which have been so eloquently proclaimed by Franklin Roosevelt. I want, in turn, to assure my fellow Americans and all of those who love peace and liberty throughout the world that I will support and defend those ideals with all my strength and all my heart. Truman had been a surprise choice for vice president at the Democratic Party nominating convention in 1944. Delegates considered several other candidates before they chose him as Roosevelt's running mate. That was at a time when presidential candidates did not make their own choices for vice president. Harry Truman lacked the fame, the rich family, and the strong speech-making skills of Franklin Roosevelt. He was a much simpler man. He grew up in the Midwestern state of Missouri. Truman only studied through high school, but took some nighttime law school classes. He worked for many years as a farmer and a small businessman, but without much success. Truman had long been interested in politics. When he was almost 40, he finally won several low-level positions in his home state. By 1934, he was popular enough in Missouri to be nominated and elected to the United States Senate. And he won re-election six years later. Most Americans, however, knew little about Harry Truman when he became president. They knew he had close ties to the Democratic Party political machine in his home state. But they had also heard that he was a very honest man. They could see that Truman had strongly supported President Roosevelt's New Deal programs. But they could not be sure what kind of president Truman would become. History gave Truman little time to learn about his new job. The most important power he now possessed was the power of atomic weapons. And soon after he became president, he faced the decision of whether or not to use that power for the first time in history. Truman firmly believed that using the atomic bomb was the only way to force Japan to surrender. So in August of 1945, he gave the orders to drop the atomic bombs on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Having found the atomic bomb, we have used it. We shall continue to use it until we completely destroy Japan's power to make war. Only a Japanese surrender will stop us. It is an awful responsibility which has come to us. We thank God that it has come to us instead of to our enemies. And we pray that he may guide us to use it in his ways and for his purposes. Days earlier, Truman had met in Potsdam, Germany, near Berlin, with the British and Soviet leaders, Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin, to plan the peace. The war in Europe had ended several months before. Good evening from the White House in Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. My fellow Americans, I have just returned from Berlin, the city from which the Germans intended to rule the world. It is a ghost city. The buildings are in ruins. Its economy and its people are in ruins. Our party also visited what is left of Frankfurt and Darmstadt. We flew over the remains of Kessel, Magdeburg, and other devastated cities. German women and children and old men were wandering over the highways, returning to bombed-out homes or leaving bombed-out cities 
searching for food and shelter. War has indeed come home to Germany and to the German people. It has come home in all the frightfulness with which the German leaders started and waged it. The three leaders agreed that their nations and France would jointly occupy Germany. They also agreed to end the Nazi party in Germany, to hold trials for Nazi war criminals, and to break up some German businesses. Foreign ministers of the Allied nations later negotiated peace treaties with Germany and other countries, including Italy, Hungary, and Romania. Eastern European nations agreed to protect the political and economic freedom of their citizens. However, Western political experts were increasingly worried that the Soviet Union would block any effort for real democracy in Eastern Europe. Truman did not trust the Soviets, and as he made plans for post-war Asia, he promised himself that he would not allow Moscow any part in controlling Japan. The leader of the American occupation in Japan was Army General Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur acted quickly to hold a series of trials for Japanese war crimes. He also launched a series of reforms to move Japan toward becoming more like a Western democracy. Women were given the right to vote. Land was divided among farmers. The idea of a national religion was ended. And the educational system was reorganized. Japan began to recover, becoming stronger than ever as an economic power. Truman and other world leaders were dealing with the problems of making peace. But at the same time, they were also trying to establish a new system for keeping the peace. The United States, the Soviet Union, Britain, and the other allies had formed the United Nations during wartime. But soon after Truman took office, they met in San Francisco to discuss ways to make the United Nations a permanent organization for peace. In July of 1944, many of the world's top economic experts met to organize a new system for the world economy. They gathered at a hotel in Bretton Woods in the American state of New Hampshire. They created the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund to help nations rebuild their economies. At the center of all the action was Harry Truman. It was not long before he showed Americans and the world that he had the ability to be a good president. He was honest, strong, and willing to make decisions. I was sworn in one night, and the next morning I had to get right to the job at hand, Truman remembered years later. In an oral history recorded with the writer Merle Miller, Truman said, I was afraid, but of course I didn't let anybody know that, and I knew that I would not be called on to do anything that I was not able to do. That's something I learned from reading history. Truman spoke of how people in the past had much bigger problems. Somehow, he said, the best of them just went ahead and did what they had to do. And they usually did all right. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.